All right, here we go. Take two. Are we coming up? Let's see if we got anybody rolling here. All right, cool. So it looks like we're live. So part two of painting is metal. I'm gonna give this another try. And basically what I wanted to do is take some time on Sunday, because today's Sunday, <laughs> but just take some time today and look at some different paintings, dig a little bit into their history, learn a little bit about what was happening with the artist and what was happening with the story that they had to illustrate. And most importantly, just look at some really amazing paintings that perhaps you haven't taken some time to really dig into and sit and look at for a little bit. So the fa first painting we're going to be looking at is The Massacre of the Innocents by Rubens. And we can see I'm going to be popping back and forth between this and Photoshop. It's going to be a little it's going to be a little uh, wonky here, but that's all right. So we're looking at this painting Massacre of the Innocents and basically what happens in The Massacre of the Innocents is that uh, the Magi, those are like the three kings, they go to Jerusalem and basically Herod tells them you should you guys need to go to to Bethlehem because he wants to find Jesus, the new king of the Jews. He doesn't want to be usurped by this other power. And uh, then then the Magi get warned in a dream, basically like don't bring Jesus back. And um, Herod gets really really angry, and he orders all the 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 boys under two years old. He orders all of them to be killed. So, it's it's not a good deal if you're if you're a young boy in Bethlehem at this time. And in this painting, we can see Rubens depicting this scene, and we we can think about how oftentimes you know artists would um, be tasked with creating a certain subject or a certain theme. And obviously, a lot of times these were these were biblical themes, as we can see here with Rubens. And I think this is kind of an interesting approach that often we forget about in painting today when we're so caught up in our own ideas and what we want to make and all these sort of things, right? So previously, you would be stuck to a certain theme. And I think if anybody out there is looking for, you know, thinking about what should I paint, look at these old themes. You're going to see a lot of these themes come up throughout this uh, video today. But there are certain themes in paintings certain stories obviously you know in modern day times we can think about these stories as being films or legends our own legends spider-man and stuff like this but nonetheless these are these these giant myths that kind of um, go across centuries generations when we look at the Rubens here we can actually see this kind of swooping motion that's coming up there so you can see that swooping motion, and this kind of ties all these figures together. It almost looks like a mosh pit of some sort, doesn't it? But you can still see this motion going through all of these figures at once as well. And that's really important when we're looking at paintings, to think about these big types of motions that are going through. This, one's, this also kind of goes down like that, and kind of goes up like that. And you can think of those big rhythms that are going through these these paintings and that's a really simple way to um, cement a composition when you have multifigural compositions. Now multifigural compositions are generally considered to be the uh, the most difficult of you know painting if we look at you know there's kind of a hierarchy of different paintings and and historical paintings, paintings that are dealing with certain legends or stories and these sort of things as well as paintings that involve landscape and multifigural compositions are considered the high point of painting. So something like this would take a, an incredible amount of planning for back then. You'd have to pose all of these. You'd have to get actual models in to pose for all these different scenes and all these different um, people. I don't know with the babies. I guess you, you just have to be really familiar with babies. Have somebody come in with a baby, I'm sure, 
and um, we can we can get a good look at this woman here. A lot of these women are fighting against um, these men that are killing all of the babies under two years old. Here we can see them all dead down here. So we can think, you know, Rubens, 400 years ago almost, thinking about these ancient themes, but also just how horrific this must be for somebody coming from a, a culture or, you know, you're not somebody who's looking at images and paintings and these sort of things all day. So you can think about these paintings as being some sort of like a major Hollywood film almost, right? So. That's pretty much what these these paintings would be. Um, as we go back, we can also see this little chomp going on on the finger there. But there's also, you know, just a landscape that they actually have to make in the back as well. It's just a, a pretty simple landscape, and these types of buildings that would be, you know, from the time, of course, as well trying to make up his own, of course, bringing his own ideas into it as well. But Peter Paul Rubens, Massacre of the Innocents. Take some time to just look at that, see what's happening in it, and consider it. I'm going to pop out the chat just in case anybody has questions. And I'll be able to do that, right? So now we have Mary in the Innocence as well. And uh, this would be a painting that he, Rubens would do of the Innocence if, you know, they all go up into heaven and they're not with Mary. So the opposite of <laughs> the Massacre of the Innocence here, we see all the horror and um, tragedy unleashed on this group of people. And now here we see them all in heaven. But we look and we see these same sort of really simple lines going through all these different bodies, right? There's that flow. It's kind of like graffiti, you know, in a way where there's a certain flow and there's a certain rhythm to the lines all together. And there's a certain rhythm that's present here as well. Massacre and then better. So from here, we're going to go on to, here we can see the same. We're going to go on to Albrecht Altdorfer, one of my favorites. And uh, I actually did a, a podcast on him as well. And uh, when we're looking at this Albrecht Art Altdorfer painting, we um, see what's called the Battle of Isis. Isis, right? And this is really reminiscent of Altdorfer's style, which is something that we can call world landscapes. So when Altdorfer was looking at the world, he's often considered the, the grandfather of landscape painting. But we're looking at uh, a viewpoint that's above the world. It's, it's bigger than one person's view. It's almost like a godlike view or an omnipotent view upon this landscape itself. So you can see all these different um, armies clashing here, but there's all this sort of motion that's occurring as well. This is a detail of the image. And you can look, as you get into this image, you can really begin to see the incredible amount of detail that takes place in these, but also that same sort of rhythm. You know, these things are just going down and they're slowly moving. It's almost like one of those futurist paintings where you see those those lines slowly cascading through the painting and repeating again and again and again. And we can take a second to look at this. Big. And um, when we talk about, you know, world landscape painting, so this is around 1480 or so, um, late 15th century. And it almost feels like Lord of the Rings, right? There's this fantasy feel to it. You can see these clouds. Look at this stuff happening in the background here. It's totally a made-up world. It's a fantasy world. Altdorfer begins that. He's painting in Germany. 
this does not, you know, look like Germany. He He's known for starting the Danube School, which is a school of artists operating around the Danube River and focusing primarily on landscape. And you can see in this landscape, the landscape itself is actually overpowering all of these figures. The landscape seems bigger. There's a more epic tone to what's happening in Altdorfer's paintings. In the Battle of Isis, I mean, you can get into all this stuff in here. You can just keep diving in. This is the highest res image I could find. But you can check out all these little castles back there, little encampments, and then these hordes of people. And this would have been, while he was painting this, you know, there in Daniel they would talk a lot about, um, and that's what this text is from up here, alluding to, to Daniel in the Bible, is this idea of the end times, or the apocalypse. So we've been thinking about the apocalypse for, for quite some time now. And um, this would also be an, an apocalyptic painting for that time, more or less. So you can think about that. This is an end of the world painting, but it's really gorgeous and fantastical at the same time as well. So that's Elbricht Altdorfer. Now, Altdorfer would also create uh, this painting of St. George. And basically, when we think about the myth of St. George or the story of St. George, we think about a there's a mean dragon, essentially. It spits venom. This is taking place in Libya. And this mean dragon can spit out venom, and it's destroying the landscape, and it's eating people, and it's eating sheep, and all this sort of stuff. It lives in a pond. Right? If we look at the Altdorfer, Altdorfer's dragon, his dragon is really pretty, um, it's almost like a frog. Right? When we look at Altdorfer's dragon, it's kind of like this frog type of a creature. And um, I'll look, we'll, we'll look at some other uh, St. George paintings as well. So basically what happens is the people in this town have this dragon on the outside of town and they're getting really upset because the dragon is annoying everybody and so they start giving it some sheep <laughs> and they're like hey take a sheep leave us alone right pretty old story well then um, the the dragon's not satisfied with the sheep so it's like I want some kids <laughs> and I want some you know people to eat some young maidens to eat these sort of things sound familiar right and um, so they start auctioning off, not auctioning off, they start basically a lottery. And the lottery determines who's going to get eaten by the dragon. And everybody in the town like puts their name in a hat, a giant hat, so to speak. And they pull out the, uh, the king's daughter. And the king's like, now, I'll, I'll give you a bunch of gold. I'll give you like you know anything you want just don't take my kid right and um, then they're like no it's not gonna work you gotta you gotta send your daughter <laughs> and um, so his daughter goes she's in like a nice dress and stuff and she's gonna about to get eaten by this dragon and then st. George is wandering around by this pond and um, the, the you know the princess is like get out of here you know, just let me be eaten by the dragon, you know. And then he's like, no, 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 that's not going to work. And so he takes out like a lance and goes at the dragon, stabs it. And um, then he's like, hey, you know, throw me your bra, basically, like a girdle, more or less. He yells to the princess. He's like, hey, throw me your girdle. And um, she throws him the girdle and he wraps it around the dragon's neck and brings it back to the village, right? And um, he's like, the dragon's just like whimpering. It's just like a little puppy dog. And um, brings it back to the village. And then um, all the people are like, oh, you got the dragon. This is awesome. And um, then he's like, okay, um, I will cut. I'll kill this dragon. I'll cut this dragon's head off. 
but all y'all got to become Christians. And they're like, all right. And um, so they all become Christian. And um, then there's an altar, and they make an altar, they make a church, and there's like a spring uh, of water, and it's like shooting up water, and this water from the spring, um, everything's cured by this water. Any type of disease, you know, anything that's bad is cured by this water. So this is a story of St. George and the dragon. And um, we can see these, the, you know, these big themes that we're working with, big myths. You're going to see this all the time in painting. And once again, that's a really cool way to look at painting is to start knowing a little bit about these stories. Because as you learn these stories, you're going to start finding out, oh, there's a bunch of different paintings that people painted throughout centuries. And they all have the same stories, right? So here's St. George and the Dragon. And um, this is Altdorfer's, Altdorfer's dragon, this kind of blobby looking guy down here. Um, doesn't look that scary, I'll admit it. Albrecht Dürer, around the same time, he'd also do this dragon. You can check that out. That's a pretty amazing one. Um, looks like a woodcut almost. And you know, when we're dissecting this drawing as well, one thing that's kind of amazing when you're looking at Durer, and you can do this in your own drawings if you're if you're hatching, is just look at the thickness and the thinness of these lines. Let's just make this a little worse. So if you look at the thickness, just where you put your line on the edge and make it a little bit thicker and then pull out like that. And you know, that makes a thick edge and then it gets skinnier. And you can see it all over the place. Thick edge, thin edge. Thick edge, thin edge. Now, one thing that Durer is doing that you can apply to your own drawings is think about where that shadow is. So this part's going to be darker, let's say, here. That's the shadowed part. That's where your thick part of your line is going to be. And when you whisk out with your line, as it gets littler towards the edge, that's going to create that idea that light is kind of, there's more light here and there's more darkness here. So that's just a really simple thing you can think about with pen and um, drawing in general, just how you're making marks. And you can see that line variation all over this, thick, thin, thick, thin, thick, thin. It's a really simple thing that really can give your lines more variation and help you with your drawings as well. So here we see St. George and the dragon killing the dragon in this image as well, and Albrecht Durer. And Durer is, the, uh, Durer is kind of the king of, of these kind of drawings, I would say. What do we got going on back here? Looks like a, looks like a little pig. Oh, that must be the princess probably back there, but I don't know what's going on with this little creature. It's like a small pig or something. But look at these little trees as well. Just just little suggestions of trees. Horizon line, suggestions of trees. Even getting closer. You know, we can see how not everything has to be spelled out. And Endura knows this. You're going to notice this in a lot of the work that you're, you're looking at. You know, we kind of live in this age where we can zoom in and out of images, just like I'm zooming in and out here in Photoshop. And that allows us kind of endless amounts of detail. But when we look at something like this Durer, we can really see that a lot of times less is more. Look at this kind of beautiful foliage, this large shape up here. But again, we're looking at the same, look at these big shadows throughout the whole thing, right? big shapes to create that composition. Altdorfer's dragon, little froggy guy. Albrecht Durer's dragon, pretty awesome. He's, I mean, he's a great person to just copy in terms of hatching. If you wanna just learn how to hatch, you can just try to sketch something like this out. Of course, try it in pencil first. Look at this plumage like on his hat, just how open that is. No need to close that line, just keep it open. 
That would be something that a lot of people would want to close these lines here and here. But you can just keep those lines open all around there. Keep all that open. And you can really feel his hand, look how he's going around the form. He's not just hatching like X's. He's going around all the form here to create the, that idea of the tree behind him. So the way he's hatching is also helping him create the idea of the form which is underneath it as well. So, dun dur. There is the text. Here's another, um, another Saint jo Saint George and the Dragon. There's not a better close up of this image. Um, but you can see here that the, the dragon is kind of like a little blob of sorts. You know, everybody interprets these these creatures differently. They're fantastic creatures. So they they probably had a lot of fun painting these, I imagine, just because you can interpret it any way you want and, you know, how an, an artist would interpret a dragon um, is a pretty fun exercise in, an, in and of itself. From there we can go to the the idea of the golden fleece and basically the golden fleece we can we can look at this story of saint george and the dragon and we can take it back a little bit farther as well and we can think about the story of the golden fleece which is greek and um, kind of has a similar um, tone to it in a lot of ways as well so this would predate christianity and um, when we when we think about the golden fleece it's often something that's brought back to a community. You're going to see that all the time in movies. Um, somebody's going out, they're finding something, and they're bringing it back to a community and helping that community. The Matrix works off this basic principle, more or less. right? So somebody goes off on a quest of some sort. They find something um, revolutionary. Usually they fail first. Um, but they find something that's going to revolutionize the way um, the community can operate and the community can live. And um, so this is, you know, Greek mythology, Golden Fleece, and pretty much in this instance, um, more basically what happens is King Pelias is, is saying, you got to go get the Golden Fleece. And then there's, like all mythology, it's kind of tough to keep track of all the different players. But we got Athamas and Mary's Nephile, and they have two kids, and the kids are Phrixus and Hele, right? Phrixus has hair that's really curly, and it's golden, so it's kind of like synonymous with the golden fleece. Anyway, his name means curly. You can just think of his being named curly. So Athamas ends up liking somebody else. He like he starts liking Eno, and Nephile, his wife gets really angry and she's like I'm getting out of here she leaves more or less when she leaves um, it like drought strikes the entire region so everybody can't eat there's no water it's no good um, then um, who is it Nephile yeah Nephile starts or no Eno starts hating the kids and she's like these kids are awful <laughs> basically and um, she can't stand the kids she says the drought's gonna end to the to the dad she's like hey if you kill your kid it's gonna end the drought and then Nephile is really upset that you know they're gonna kill her kids so she comes back with this golden ram that's winged as well and um, the ram is like Poseidon's kid from a sheep there's like a whole nother story with this ram as well anyway the the kids end up taking off because they're gonna get killed they end up taking off on this ram and then the girl falls off and she dies and then um, the the boy Phrixus Curly ends up in Georgia and then he kills the ram the ram then becomes Ares up in the sky, and um, he uh, 
he he takes the fleece, this golden fleece from this ram. I know this is an insane story. Um, takes the golden fleece from this ram and he puts it on a tree and he has a dragon guard it, right? So when we think of <laughs> the uh, the idea of this golden fleece in our hands and the and a dragon is guarding this fleece as well. And here we can see this is a Giovanni Crisato painting and we can see here he is getting the golden fleece. So it's a really similar story to St. George where he's got to go out, he's got to kill a dragon, and then he's got to get this thing. He's got to get the golden fleece. And um, by getting that, he's going to save the community and get rid of all the drought and all the bad stuff that's happening. So this is going to be common with a lot of these different paintings is that we start thinking about um, broader mythological things that can happen. I think I've got... Do I have a golden fleece here? I might not. Nope. I don't have that one here. Yeah, here it is. And again, we can when we're looking at this painting, we can see just how simple these brush marks are. Just looking at the painting again and looking at how we don't need to get into all the little curlies on this this dead ram, I guess we could call it. Um, we can just make that with a couple brush brush strokes. And look at these people back here. Look at this face right here. Look how simple that is. Just blocking in those big eye socket shapes underneath the nose shadow shape underneath the bottom lip shadow shape, underneath the chin shadow shape. You know, these faces are, are really blocked in rather quickly, but that's one of the, the beauties of painting. As we, we back off from it, we can see a lot more detail, and our eyes just kind of naturally do this thing called closure, which basically means our eyes can, can close off forms, more or less. You can even take a look at this dragon up close. Look at his dragon. Really cool. It even has some smoke coming from its nostrils still after killing it. So we can see that these themes that have been, you know, painted again and again and again that are, you know, Christian based also have different mythologies that predate Christianity as well, digging into these very similar themes. And like I was saying, you can look at Hollywood films to see these same themes coming up and up again and again and again as well. Um, yeah, I'm starting to check the, yeah, I guess you can all see that too. Checking out the, the chat a little bit. This is tough. I need another monitor. I think I just need another monitor. Here's the Detroit painting. This is a same artist uh, that painted this. And this would be the, the killing of a stag. If you, I don't know if you can see it totally right here. I think I got this in Photoshop too. Yeah, here it is. And here we can see, this is the best images that, that I could get of it. Um, but you can see all these dogs kind of ripping this this deer apart, this stag of some sort, and these rich aristocrats that are hunting it down. So when we think of hunting now, um, we, we kind of have a different image, unless you're like fox hunting in England or something like that. But hunting back then, that was something that the aristocracy would do. And there would be, you know, entire parts around the castle where nobody else could hunt, only rich people could hunt um, because they would get all the meat and get all the good stuff right so here we see another painting these same these same really stylized simplified brush marks to create this uh, stag which is being attacked by all these dogs but we can look for that movement once again we can look for this sort of movement that we see come up time and time again in these tort these sort of paintings that just move our eye around and, and simplify things. This is how composition works, more or less. 
and I know that's it's kind of difficult. You might be like, oh, he's just drawing lines on the on the painting. What is he talking about? But look at this this dog. How this dog's form flows with the rest of the dogs. So this is a really common way of of moving the eye around a painting and also solidifying that composition within the painting itself. This is Detroit as well if you want to look up this artist. So here's his dragon and then his other one here is the dead stag. So from there we're going to get into um, we're going to get into Grunewald, and basically this painting, when we think about Christ paintings and Christ looking like he's really, really beat up, this, this Grunewald uh, painting, which is part of a three-part altarpiece series in, um, in this village, this is about as brutal as we can get with the Jesus painting. We can see up here in the in the close up, he's decaying. His lips are blue. There's sores all over his body. He's got like thorns actually stuck into him all over the place. There's this really um, simple wooden cross that is totally cold. All the colors are cold, and in the background, it's just this kind of darkness, right? But as we look at this painting, let's look at it in Photoshop. Um, here we go. There's the close-up. But I should have one more. I don't have another one. Okay, so we'll look on the. Um, we'll look here instead. Right. So when when we look at this painting, this painting was made for uh, some monks that were living in this small village and basically there was this skin disease called St. Anthony's Fire and this skin disease would cause, cause you to get all these sort of lesions all over your body you'd go into convulsions so here you can even see the body looks like it's convulsing you know when we look at these hands close up they're in agony they're in absolute pain and the, the purpose of this painting was the monks living in this village had actually set up a hospice. So this is where, this was essentially a church and a hospice where people with this disease would go to die. And this group of monks, they're called the Antonites. And um, they would have, you know, take care of people in their last days. So now you're thinking, why would you know, if they're being taken care of in their last days, why on earth would they want to, to look at a painting like this that has so much suffering and pain in it? And, and essentially, they're saying that um, Christ had their disease, and, and he survived. And what happened after he died? You know, he went to heaven. So this would be a painting showing them that, that Christ suffered even more than they did and you can even look at the um, if you look at the nurse here oh nurse this is Mary so so typically Mary would be um, in blue right in a lot of these paintings at the certain time and Grunewald paints her as a nurse so this is Mary as a nurse in the painting so the people that were you know at this hospice in their last days would also see this painting and they could identify with Mary as a nurse in the painting as somebody praying for their you know um, good health or whatever you want to call it up front here we would have Mary Magdalene I think we got one of her too yeah up front here we have Mary Magdalene and here's she's got a, a jar that would contain some ointments of some sort that they could use to uh, put on the wounds and this sort of thing and this, of course, she would be praying, praying, you know, heartily for Jesus as well. And here we have John the Baptist. And um, let's see, what is he saying? Become more. Yeah, right. So it, basically it says he must become greater. I must become less. That's what it says here. 
And so that's alluding, alluding to the idea that the person themselves need not, you know, exalt themselves as being something greater, but God should become something greater themselves. So, and here we have this uh, sheep that has, is actually bleeding into a goblet carrying the cross as well. So we could see that as representing Jesus's flock or whatever you'd want to call it. But you can see here they're actually bleeding into a goblet. And these, these types of paintings, I think when people look at paintings like this, oftentimes we want to think like, oh, they're symbols, right? And um, they are symbols and there are stories that can be discerned from, from these things, certainly. And the way we look at them it is probably almost impossible to think of how they would be looked at previously to the way we're looking at them now today and in the interaction with them. And so this would be a painting that people, the doctors would actually have people go to. And he would, ha when the patients would come in, they would go and look at this, this painting. And that was part of their treatment. Go and look at this painting and meditate on this painting and what you're seeing in this painting itself. And that was part of their treatment and coming to terms with their own deaths as well. So this is the Grunewald crucifixion. Uh, where is it? I don't think I have the place where it actually is located. Um, but yeah, they can see that mainly the idea is they can see that they are suffering. The people looking at this painting are suffering. And they can look at this painting and think that, you know, the highest God of the world suffered more. And that could give them some sort of solace or to think about suffering itself. Really an amazing piece. Now, as well as this piece, here's his resurrection. You know, Grunewald's not all gloom and doom. We look at this painting and we can see just how black it is. Such a dark painting. And then here's his resurrection painting. He's like, everything's all right. I love these... Uh, these soldiers up front in this painting, the, the guards of the tomb, but their bodies and just the, the perspective on those bodies is really amazing. And, you know, Jesus is, of course, just glowing here, rising. Look at that amazing drapery coming down into the tomb as well. The guards asleep out front. Now, as well as this painting... You got a close up? Yeah. So there's these other altar pieces um, that are in this same church that, that Grunewald made for the same church. And when you look at these, they're just some of the oddest paintings that you'll ever find. And this is the this Temptations of St. Anthony. And I've got some of these big. We can we can look at those in Photoshop. Here we go. So this is a painting. This is like 1580 or something, right? I mean, this looks straight out of <laughs> some sort of fantasy art you'd expect from the, this day and age almost. I mean, just take a look at these creatures. And here we're talking about um, St. Anthony. And he's a, he's a monk that retires. And he's like, I'm just going to go to the desert. I'm not going to eat any food. I'm just going to hang out in the desert. And I'm gonna um, meditate. I'm not gonna eat food and um, fast. And while he's out in the desert, he starts having all these temptations and all these demons come to visit him. So there's a lot of good um, paintings by a lot of different artists that have used this same theme, right? That's kind of the theme of today is artists using these big themes, right? And um, they would also be able to really use their own fantasy to create these sort of images. Here's Michelangelo's version of the same painting. This one we can get really up close to. This is a young Michelangelo painting the, the temptation of St. Anthony. Not a painting you always, you know, that's super famous. Look at this. Just super creepy animals. So he would be tempted by, you know, 
all sorts of different temptations that one might have, but also just actual demons and creatures that would be attacking him. This little boat down there, I never noticed that. But look how look how simple this this landscape is down here, and that's that's one of the the amazing things about these sort of paintings, is just how detailed you can get up here. And then down here, it just doesn't really matter all that much. It's a simple blue wash, some white lines, and that indicates the idea of a landscape. Of course, we've got atmospheric perspective. It's a really simple thing you can do in your paintings. Dark, a little bit lighter, a little bit lighter. Makes stuff look like it's going away. It's a really simple way to do it. Dark, a little bit lighter, a little bit lighter. And um, that's just atmospheric perspective. You can see it pretty simply in that painting. But again, we've got this circular, you know, circular form, this movement going in a circle with St. Anthony right in the middle there. I think I have another, yeah. Bosch would do a, uh, Hieronymus Bosch would also do a St. Anthony temptation painting. Bosch, of course, super influential to the Surrealists hundreds of years later. Look at this little this little guy coming out of the water down here. Happy little pig. Golden the golden earring. All these little gremlins walking down. And Bosch would have existed in a time that uh, there would be a lot of, you know, brimstone sort of preaching so a lot of um, fire and brims brimstone so a lot of these demons they would they would speak about these sort of demons in the culture itself and that would that would seep into the paintings as well look at this guy <laughs> really amazing really amazing painting I think we might have a couple more got a Grunewald there do we have any more temptations yeah, the Grunewald Temptation. So those are those are really cool paintings to, to look at um, if you're into those sort of themes as well. And this there's there's a triptych. There's three altarpieces that he created. First was the crucifixion, and then. Temptation of Saint Saint Anthony was another. Max Ernst would also do a Temptation of Saint Anthony painting that you can check out. That's super cool as well. And Dolly would make one too. So here you can see similar things. Here's Saint Anthony. You can see the desert's perfect for Dolly, of course. Um, but these temptations coming in on these giant horses and these sort of things. Cool, and that is what I got for y'all today. If you got any questions, feel free to ask me anything you want in the chat. And um, we'll do this again next week. It's giving it my best so far, and um, we'll keep on trying. And just starting to get to new, know how to know how to use this, know what I'm doing with uh, with OBS. So I think I need a second monitor. <laughs> Thanks a lot for watching. I'll see you next time.